Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the How To Chess podcast. Of course, we are a weekly chess improvement show. Try to give you a little bit of info to help out your game in a short amount of time. And we are joined this week by someone I am a big fan of. He is a chess player, of course, a trainer, an acclaimed author, the 2006 Swedish national champion. He's written four chess books. He's best known for the Mastering Chess series, Mastering Chess Strategy, Mastering Opening Strategy, and Mastering Endgame Strategy, which I believe are now all available on Chessable. And I, as you you guys may have heard, I often recommend these books for the intermediate level on up. Um, I have enjoyed them myself. He's also a frequent lecturer for the U.S. Chess School, and I highly recommend you check out his lectures, which you can find by searching on YouTube. Um, and what he's going to be talking about this week is how to work on your own games. But before we dive into that subject, let's welcome him to the show, Grandmaster Johan Helston. How are you, Johan? Hello there, Ben. Uh, very Happy to be here. Many thanks for inviting me. Uh, this is a very famous podcast, so I'm really pleased to be here oh, around. Thank you. And, uh, it will be Great. interesting to talk about this subject, uh, about how to analyze your own games. I think it's uh, sometimes it's a forgotten part. No, We speak a lot about which are the best uh, books or publications about openings or maybe end games, but uh, sometimes we forget that we should uh, probably focus a little more on ourselves, on our own chess, because that's actually where we are most likely to be able to, to improve. And I mean, I'm not the one who invented this uh, theory. It's something back in the days of Botvinnik, if you remember. I mean, not remember from the days of Botvinnik, but remember looking at his uh, books and so on. Uh, he always uh, highlighted this, uh, the importance of working on your own games. And if you look at his games collection, Botvinnik's game collection, there are fantastic comments in, in that. Uh, back, I mean, back then there were no engines and so on. But still, his uh, quality of analysis was was impressive, right? Amazing, yeah. And as you say, it has a rich history, um, the, the work of analyzing one's own games. But I think that one question that I do hear a lot from people trying to improve is the proper use of engines. I feel like it's a somewhat controversial topic um, because people, old school chess grandmasters who grew up before engines often will say not to use them just because they didn't use them. But then other people are like, well, this tool is so easy. Why wouldn't I use it to blunder check? So where do you come down on the, the use of engines when analyzing games, Johan? Yeah, I think this is one of the most complex topics and I'm struggling myself also. I mean, the key problem, in my opinion, is that, yeah, you turn on the engine and you get uh, the truth, probably. It's, it's hard to, to believe that the engine would, would get it wrong. Uh, only in very complex positions, it uh, might need more time, but usually it will very soon provide you with the right move. So, okay, it's interesting for you to know that in this or that position, knight f6 would have won the game instead of knight g5. But is this information really useful to us? But I think the problem is that once you turn on the engine, you also kind of turn off your brain and you just look at those moves and you maybe you copy it into your annotations and so on. And I think I would prefer, both as a player and as a coach, I would prefer that a human would analyze on their own. Maybe they end up providing, producing some uh, incorrect analysis, but the effort of analyzing, uh, that's the same effort that you have to put while you're sitting at the board, right? If we're speaking now strictly about improving your results, we're not speaking about some perfect uh, quality of a, of a written publication and so on. You analyze this or that endgame and you need to have all the moves 100% correct. That's something else. But if you speak about improvement, what you need is to be able to analyze uh, any position uh, in a in a swift way, in a in a good way, and and for that it's unfortunately of no help to to look at the engine while you're analyzing your games. It will tell you which was the right move, which was the wrong move, but it won't, uh, as far as I, I think, uh, it's it won't help your your thinking process. Yeah, that makes sense. Now another question that comes up a lot, Johan, is. Um, how to adjust for online play. Because again, a lot of this advice has been handed down for people who are playing like four to six hour chess games. Um, but a lot of the more common practice methods these days are if, you know, if you're patient, you might play a 25 minute per side rapid game or something like that. So how does one uh, adjust their game analysis approach for as you speed up the game? Yeah, I mean, I forgot to say about the previous topic that it is, of course, important to take into account what the engine uh, says. I, I just wanted to highlight that, that. Once you look at one of your games, you played last night some, some game at the club or you play some online game and so on, you look at it in the end. Once you you're ready, you're finished analyzing your game, that's a good moment to turn on the engine. And then you will add 
those engine comments. But of course, you won't remove your own analysis. And I would say that also immediately after playing the game, that's a good moment to to go over the game and add your thoughts during the game. I was thinking that uh, in this position I should swap queens, uh, but uh, maybe it was wrong and so on. But it's important to, to try to find the underlying ideas to what what made you uh, make this or that decision. The thought process is, is very important. Now, what you're speaking about, uh, the shorter format of online games. I know a few people will play like uh, old school, uh, like two hour uh, for... I mean, long games, it's not that common. Uh, most people will play very quickly. So, of course, you have to adjust also this routine of analyzing your games. I would say that, I mean, if you play a short game, probably the the opening part, the strategy part, perhaps middle game strategy will be the most important one. Once you're down to very little time, uh, obviously, the quality of, of play will, will decrease uh, drastically. So you cannot be too harsh about... Uh, the, the last part of the game. Um, but still, I think somebody said this also, that when you look at, for example, Blitz games, when you look at uh, Magnus Carlsen playing Blitz uh, or, and other players of, of his level, so to speak, it's interesting to notice that actually the game becomes very intuitive. So it's interesting to follow such games because you have to rely a lot on intuition. So if you play a game, let's say 10-minute game, you end up in some time, time trouble. I mean, you're down to one minute, some rook end game, and you can commit some mistakes there. Uh, also, it's a kind of, um, how can I say, uh, it, it's a way to see like an exam. You can see how you're dealing with your, your intuition in the, in the end game, how, how well developed it is. So in a way, it's also interesting to work with the uh, faster games because it's, uh, it will be like a diagnostic of, of your, your intuitive play also because simply you don't, you don't have too much time to, to look into all the details. So in that way, I think it's also interesting to, to work with those um, Faster games, but you cannot be too harsh, of course, uh, as for the quality. Okay, and I guess you wouldn't spend as much time on a faster game as you would a, a slower one. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and Johan, obviously you're a trainer in high demand. I know you work with a lot of students, um, and I'm sure you look at their games when you do this. So what are the most common kind of recurring mistakes you see, whether they be of sort of a straight-up chess um, dimension or more of a psychological one? You mean mistakes being committed during a, a chess game? The types of mistakes, yeah, yeah. That, you, that you see in your students' games. Uh, I would usually say that there are three kinds of, of mistakes. You have the first uh, branch of mistakes, which is like the uh, lack of attention mistake. You blunder the queen, for example. Uh, yeah, this is horrible, of course, but usually it's not related to chess, uh, how can I say, chess skills or chess knowledge. It's more about concentration, right? which is something yeah. which is extremely important in our sport. I mean, if you compare with other sports, uh, of course, in any sport, uh, concentration is important. But uh, if you make one mistake, mistake in chess, uh, usually you're, you're lost. It's not like in, in soccer where one team can make 1-0, but the other team can later on equal the score. If, in chess, if you lose a piece, uh, you're more likely to lose another one than to recover that piece, right? Yeah. Chess is it's a more se sequential game in this sense. So that's why, I mean, concentration is extremely important in our game. And also you can say, say that if you have, let's say, a game, you play the first 20 moves, uh, it's better for you if your general, how can I say, precision on, over these 20 moves, it's like 80% all the time. If you play some moves like the perfect moves on five occasions, but then you play five blunders, <laughs> uh, imagine for yourself, it would be a complete disaster. So it's better to, to have some kind of even even play, if you see what I mean. Maybe you won't play the most fantastic moves all the time or the engine moves and so on, but you can keep the game on a high, high level, uh, avoiding mistakes. Anyway, back to what we were speaking about. First group of mistakes, uh, unprovoked mistakes like, like plundering the queen or not seeing that tactical motive. The second mistake, I would say, uh, when you forgot about some, something that you should know about. It could be something about the opening that you should play for d5 against the Grunfeld to create a pass pawn. It might be that uh, in the middle game, if you have an isolated queen's pawn, don't swap too many pieces. That would be like a typical mistake. Uh, probably you studied this, but maybe you forgot. Uh, you didn't keep this in mind. And uh, in the end game, for example, I put my rook in the wrong place uh, regarding the past pawn of my opponent and so on. Things that you should probably know, but maybe you didn't uh, apply them over the board. And the third group is simply where you didn't know 
you got into some position which you didn't really know about. And so it's a lack of knowledge. So you have to work more on, on basics, no? To, you have to uh, work more on going over uh, chess, uh, chess books and so on. So I think these are the three different groups. Unprovoked mistakes, uh, lack of uh, applying uh, existing knowledge and skills, and, and the last one is simply uh, lack of, of, of knowledge, and which is, for a coach, it's, it's the most, how can I say, forgivable group. If your student makes mistakes of this kind, uh, they didn't know how to defend the rook and bishop versus rook. <laughs> All right. I mean, it's not so easy to figure this out if you don't know it. Uh, so, yeah, that would be my answer. And is one of these, do you find yourself dealing with one of these more than the others? Which one do you think is the most common? I mean, that depends on the player. And uh, once you have a player, once you have a student who doesn't make many mistakes of the first group, like this uh, lack of attention, lack of concentration, then you're already on good, how can I say, there is a good projection with this, uh, with, with this player. I mean, uh, you can expect that uh, this, this player will have a lot of success uh, later on. And, and when they only make mistakes because of lack of knowledge, I mean, it's, it's easy for you as a coach. Then you know that you simply have to show more things. You have to uh, work on more, more stuff. And on the other hand, if they, the second group, if they forget uh, how to play, how was the opening? If you play the, the dragon, maybe you shouldn't castle there and so on. If they keep on making the, the same mistakes, then you have a problem, of course. Um, so I guess all of them appear, but it depends a lot of, on, on the player, right? It depends a lot on, on the player. Okay. So, Johan, this has been great. Um, I, as we mentioned, this is a short format show. So just to wrap up, um, what would be like your sort of, obviously everyone's situation is different in terms of how much time they can devote to their chess, but let's say someone does manage to play one tournament per month. Maybe they're playing four four-hour games per month. How much time should they spend on analysis with, with those games? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I remember when I was uh, playing uh, still in the Swedish Olympic team, and I remember one of my teammates back then was uh, Evgeny Agrest, uh, Swedish Grandmaster. And he, he was saying that in order to analyze one of my games properly, I need at least 10 hours. So that, that's a lot wow. of time. And I think yeah. uh, unless you're a full-time professional, it's hard to make that fit in if you play tournaments tournament of nine games, we're speaking 90 hours. Uh, however, to be a little more realistic, uh, I mean, I, I think that half an hour should be a good uh, duration of uh, your own analysis. Hopefully a, a bit more, like, like one hour. And I think also you can do it on your own, but sometimes also you can perhaps uh, meet, uh, you can arrange to meet some other player. It doesn't need to be a coach, really. It can simply be somebody who knows a little more about chess than, than you do, and still it will be very, uh, very productive. So I guess if you play one tournament a month, uh, yeah, I, if you finish that tournament by, by Sunday, I think by Monday, during Monday, you should have a look at those games and spend a few hours uh, hopefully like, like half an hour per game. And the, the, I think the most important thing is trying to identify the key moments uh, of, of this or that game. Where were the mistakes uh, made? Um, which might be the underlying reasons why I committed this or that, uh, that mistake? Uh, sometimes it's easier for somebody else to, to look at this, but you can also do it on your own. And sometimes you can see that you, you make the same mistakes over and over again, then definitely you have to... Um, you have to look into it. And I think also when you play like Blitz games uh, online, even those games are interesting to look at, I mean, uh, quickly. But uh, it's, it's important. If you look at uh, Botvinnik's uh, book, I think he, had, he has more than 1,000 games uh, analyzed. Okay, yeah. many years also. Another thing that I forgot to tell you is that when, you, um, when you're working with the engine, we were saying this, uh, we were speaking about the engine, and we would love to find the engine moves and so on. If you can play like the engine, you're very happy. But I do think that it's actually more admirable if you can play like, uh, like Aronian or Caruana or Nakamura, Carlson. I think that's, uh, people say, okay, I want to play like Stockfish. But <laughs> I think actually it's, it's better for us to play like the best uh, humans uh, in the world. So sometimes I can see this controversy. You, you see some game online like... Uh, MVL versus Caruana and so on. And people are saying, hey, they're not, uh, how, how could he play like that? Uh, he could have played Bishop B5 instead and he had a huge advantage according to Stockfish. But I think humans will always be humans and we can certainly learn from the engine, but in the end, we should just try to play like, like humans. 
Okay. Excellent note to end on. And yeah, I mean, the humans already seem like engines to me, the super <laughs> grandmasters. So, uh, right. I, so yeah, let's bring it down a peg and aim for the uh, 2,800 level chess instead of the 3,500 level. Um, That's well, right. Johan, uh, this has been excellent as expected. Um, I know you're a busy guy, so really want to thank you for joining us here on How to Chess. Okay, thanks a lot to you and, and uh, see you next time. Okay, take care. Okay, bye-bye.